Hey everybody, welcome back to Digging Deeper. Yes. Uh, Robert here with Pete and uh, going to dive in to Digging Deeper stuff. So, uh, oh man, okay, it's a sentimental uh, one for me. It's a sentimental one and I, for all of us, um, yeah. so you guys, most of you guys watch Digging Deeper pretty regularly. I think if you're honest, you know that this is usually, hey, let's talk about the message yesterday. You know, it was a, it was a fine message. It was whatever, a really, but, I actually really appreciate it. Yeah, message. but you know, I, I don't I think, it. um, encouraging yeah i appreciate that i think more than anything though i just man i wanted to spend some time talking about you uh more than my message um and so obviously uh big announcement yesterday at church yeah. um we don't have to rehash it a ton because more often than not digging deeper audience has listened to the service but just quick recap maybe and then we can yeah. kind of um, in case anyone wasn't listening or what at church yesterday, yeah, I shared basically that to keep it really to the point that last Sunday or yesterday was my final Sunday as a staff member here at Rice City Church. Um, I'll still pop in when I can here and there. Um, I, I mean, Rice City is going to be in my blood, um, in my ministry mm. blood for probably the rest of my life, and and I and I love Rice City um, more than anything. I love you, the people of Rice City. Um, love you, Pete. And just um, just the connections or relationships along the way, um, but rooting for Rice City's future. But um, the opening of a new chapter means a closing of mine um, here at Rice City. But it also sparks the opening, or I would say even not even an opening, a continuation of a chapter that's been being written, um, that's been in my heart for over ten years to launch out and plant a movement, a church, um, something that would really start to reach people and empower Christians. Um, to be the light of the world in a powerful way. Yeah, so it's heavy. I know. Uh, <laughs> I know. And after, I I didn't. Uh, I gotta be honest. I didn't go out in the hallway after first service. <laughs> I stayed in the green room. Um, but I know, man. It was just. I more than anything, I wanted to make sure that people felt they had a chance to connect with you and stuff. And um, you just, you know, man, you've you've really uh, you've. You've affected a lot of people's lives in a very positive way. I almost said you've touched a lot of people and they've touched you. <laughs> <laughs> School of Rock? Anything? No. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> oh, man. I... You got to be careful with your yeah, language yes, yes. when you're working. Propriety is not always uh, the strongest suit here <laughs> at Rice City deeper. Church. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> um, but I thought it might be kind of fun. Uh, just like, you know, in some ways time is time is strange because when you're in it it feels sometimes slow but uh -huh. then you step back and realize oh my goodness it's been three years been just in. went by yeah um like there's a part of me that's like like didn't you just oh it has yeah it's been three years. so i thought maybe like one thing we've never really talked about much is we have talked about like your early story and uh, you've shared on ding deeper you know a little bit about your upbringing and coming to faith yeah, uh, you share a really cool story about going to a, a missions trip to to hit on a girl and <laughs> ended up just getting impacted by God yeah. on that. So after you became a Christian, you were I think you were like what like nineteen twenty ish right in there somewhere. Um, or? I was seventeen. Seventeen. Yeah. So you finish high school. Yeah. What What then led you to think I want to make church work my life goal like what what was the next step for you after you became a christian that led to that yeah so i i actually didn't think that that was going to be my path um crazy story um i'm i'm probably um not always in this environment but when i actually came to faith um it was on a trip with ywam youth with a mission and there was a staff member with ywam that actually came and prophesied over me. I don't know if you've ever had that happen to you. I know that yeah, you have. Sure. Um, but he prophesied over me and actually told me I was going to be a pastor, which at the time was crazy to me mm. because I was, I literally had was like had smuggled <laughs> like some stuff with me and things like that on this trip and all kinds of different stuff. And I did not think that there was any possibility that I could actually end up on that pathway. Um, and lo and behold, I actually finished, um, I went to SDSU ended up being part of a whole bunch of on-campus ministry there, ended up starting a couple ministries on campus and What'd things like that. What did you study in college? Like, what'd you go for? What were, your, what were you thinking in your head you were going to do? So I started my freshman year, and maybe you can relate 
as a psychology major. Which and, means I don't know what I want to do with my life. Yes. And then lasted about <laughs> one semester and then um, actually ended up deciding, you know what? Actually, I'm going to do political science. And so... You're a political science major? Yes. I did not know that. Yeah. I interned with a uh, congressman and everything. You did? Do you remember Brian Bilbray by chance? No, I, it was, it was before I, my time. Yep, yeah. I interned with him. Um, so I was on a political track. So you wanted to like... Get into government? I thought I was going to be a like in a congressman. Um, there was a, a How did thought I never of know that? there That's you so go. Crazy. There was a thought of even maybe going towards a um, a legal career, um, which kind of you can kind of leap between worlds sometimes. Sure. And so there was there was all kinds of thoughts. You know, I'm young. I'm I'm the world is an oyster, right? And so I actually ended up graduating with a political science degree, and. Um, during that internship and then just kind of getting into the political world some um, campaigning I got I got to be part of some campaigns and things like that I realized man I don't think I want to do this <laughs> mm. I just don't think that it's actually for me um, and now so on, let me ask a question yeah not for you in the sense that the, the actual work doesn't fit you or your passion isn't in it. My passion it seems like it. that actually could be really good work for you. Yeah. 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 I, I, I'm a little bit of an, of an activist by nature. Yeah. You're a little very bit. outgoing. You, you're good connecting with people. Those kind of things. It, more so, I just wasn't passionate about it. Hmm. Um, I'm passionate to a degree. And then I realized there was other things that I cared about more, which was ultimately just people. Um, and I realized politics is... Um, a little bit of a step removed from people. It doesn't have to be, and it shouldn't be probably, but it is. And so um, from there, I actually ended up uh, joining into almost like a social work field right out of college. So I, my first job was working with juvenile probation here in San Diego. And I was actually working with mm. um, kids that were on probation um, or actually in juvenile hall and things like that and kind of helping them through what's called the case plan, um, but really just kind of helping their rehabilitation you know, process and, and things like that and just mentoring, going to their houses every day. It was a bunch of different things. It was pretty awesome. Hmm. And so I got to do that. You're 22, 23 at this time? I was like 22, yeah. yeah okay. and, then, um, and then ended up doing a few other things in the nonprofit social work world, um, including I had a grant from the NFL to do a youth education town in Golden Hill and actually ran a student team empowerment program where I actually found master students from SDSU and partnered them with inner city youth for for one on one mentoring and created structures and curriculum around that. Um, mm. So there's and then I have even there's I could go through it, but there's there's a bunch of different things I did. I worked for child welfare services for a little bit, but did a bunch of different things in that arena. And at the same time, I was serving in the youth ministry at Horizon Christian Fellowship here in San Diego. Just like a life group leader for students or something like that? Um, or you no. So I started out just serving in the youth ministry. And uh, my good friend Brooks Fuller was the youth pastor at the time there. And uh, and a little bit larger youth group at the time. And and he just basically said, well, you know what? Why don't you... He kind of wanted to, to give me a chance to step into some leadership and things. And he said, why don't you kind of design and envision and then implement a student um, leadership program. And so I said, absolutely. So we did. Mm. It started gaining some steam. And then he he kind of invited me and said, you know, I think that you, maybe you have a gift of preaching. And so I started to um, actually preach with him. And we started to preach um, and kind of switch off here and there in the youth ministry. And then pretty quickly um, from there, he he and then some of the other pastors at Horizon, they identified and said, we think that you're supposed to be a pastor. And I think that you should come on staff and be a pastor. As a matter of fact, our our, our middle school ministry has been kind of neglected and passed around for a little bit. And it had dwindled to about maybe 15, 20 kids. Mm. And, and they said, would you want to come on staff and breathe some new life and just lead and pastor? in that way and then and then you know see what else you can do as part of the team and i was like okay and you know i, I just realized at that point that it was what i was called to do i was excited about it i had vision for it and over um just just a you know the next year or so i ended up watching that that middle school ministry really kind of grow and start to reach a lot of kids and grew to you know well over 100 kids and, and so forth and so on we ended up remodeling the room um mm -hmm. if you ever need a budget to remodel your room youth pastors uh, get a hold of the women's ministry oh, and and, and propose to partner with them for a space for their women's ministry and your youth ministry that's what did it um it also mm -hmm. helped that the senior pastor's wife was uh leading the women's ministry at the time so um if you really want a great budget 
find a lead pastor who has a kid in middle school ministry, and you'll have all the money in the world. All those kind of things. So, yep, there's lots of strategy with it. No. Um, and so, so we ended up doing those kind of things. It was really exciting. Um, and then a lot of you know that Ashley and I um, actually had a little bit of a um, we had a fall. And so, um, at that time I also started to, they, they came back to me and said, Hey, we need someone to lead a young adults ministry. And so I started lead, leading the young adults ministry. You're still um, mid twenties right now. I'm still I'm mid twenties. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and at this time, um, uh, my wife, Ashley and I, she was a, in the young adults ministry and I became the young adults pastor as well. And, uh, and she, um, she and I started dating, we got engaged. Um, and we ended up actually, um, having, uh, intimacy before we're married, um, which actually led to a pregnancy, mm. um, that we covered, you know, for a while. And so until we couldn't anymore. And, um, and so that actually caused me to step down from ministry for a while. I went back into social work, um, mm. for a season. And then eventually that same church horizon called me up and said, they're going through a, a lead pastor transition of their own and said, you know, we need you to come back. Um, How long kid, was that gap that you were back in social work? Um, it was maybe about a year and a half. Okay. And so then from there, maybe even less, maybe about a year. Did you, during that season, did you feel in your heart like you knew this was like, okay, I need to step down for a little while? Or did it feel like, oh man, this is I thought over. I was done. You thought you were done? I thought I was done. So um, I submitted myself. I confessed to the entire pastoral team, which was such a difficult thing because there was probably about... 20, 30, there's like 30 pastors, you know, that were part of this pastoral team, big mm -hmm. church, lots of, lots of, you know, uh, not campuses at the time, but you know, other horizons. Um, and so these guys were in a lot of ways, my heroes, you know, here on earth. And so it was so difficult to sit in that room and then actually share with them, uh, just the darkness that sin has and the effect that it has on my relationship with Jesus and had had it on my relationship with Jesus. And so that was a very humbling, very, hard and difficult time. And when I went into social work again, I thought that was what I was going to do. Mm -hmm. I didn't expect to get a call back. I, I submitted myself to a restoration process with those pastors and was meeting with some of them, reading books, um, you know, doing as everything that I could. And it wasn't so I could get a job back. It was because I just wanted my relationship with Jesus restored. That's all I cared about. And I did not expect to be called back into ministry. Um, but then when they called me back and said kind of something similar and said, hey, our kids ministry has been a little bit, you know, like we've kind of, you know, passed it around as well and it needs some revamping. Would you come back and really give it some life? And so like I said birth through fifth kind of thing. Um, yeah. So okay. birth, yeah, birth through fifth. And so at that point, um, I was like, I've never done kids ministry, but let's go. And so so we did. And then we ended up seeing um, an awesome move of God. We saw the the volunteer team grow to well over 100 volunteers on that team, um, which was a, a huge step from where it was. Um, we ended up getting structure. We started things like a clubhouse once a month that was um, that really had a lot of efficacy in, in winning kids to Christ and helping them get excited about their relationship with Jesus. Um, we did all kinds of fun things. We, we had a VBS that was just off the rails and was, um, was different than what um, Horizon had seen in a long, long time. And so it was, it was a really exciting season, but I knew eventually that I, I wanted to lead more. And I started to see this, this gift and calling of leadership start to bubble up inside of me more and more and more. And so I started to want to do more. And so I started stepping into things like men's ministry here and there and started to um, help with pastoral care a lot and, and, and different things within the church. Um, but I realized at some point that there was a lid and I, and I was looking to see what could I do and how could I serve you and maximize my life more, Jesus. Mm. And, uh, and so I just started praying that prayer and um, just wanted to make myself available. And I was sitting in the nursery of all places, um, just praying because it was a quiet room. It's one quiet room I can find. And uh, just praying. And, and at that point, God told me and said, just, just look around. And so I had written out um, a, a month or so earlier a life mission statement and, and made all these goals for my life and everything like that. You still have it? Um, I do. It's actually on like a little moleskin notebook that I used to carry in my back pocket. And so I actually do have those notebooks still. Um, but my life mission statement hasn't really changed. It's to see the world change for Christ, by Christ, by every single believer being activated, empowered, and platform for the name of Jesus. And so um, so really, really 
excited about seeing people um, be activated into their spiritual gifts and their callings, their passions, um, all those types of things that, that God has placed miraculously and I think even supernaturally in their lives um, for the sake of building the kingdom of heaven on earth as it is in heaven. And so um, I'm passionate about that. And so I, I, I go online and I look, I don't even know what I searched. I don't know what I did at the time, but I, I ended up stumbling on this, this job ad um, for Shadow Mountain. Hmm. Um, and and, wait, how old are you right now? 30? Oh, man. I was... About 10 years ago? 8 years ago? Yeah, probably about that time. Okay. So I, I was at Shadow Mountain for 6 years here for 3... Yeah, so about 10 years ago. Okay. Um, and so at that point, um, I you know, I start to read through the, the job listing, and it literally, in other words, but almost the same words, is my life mission statement. Hmm. And so I'm looking at this, and I'm like, okay, Lord, is this you? And so I actually just... I stop right there in the nursery... And I just call, right? And I called the number and they actually tell me and say, you know, actually the job is, is, is already filled. Um, I don't know if it was, but it, you know, the job is already filled. But actually there's this other job that I think you'd be perfect for. Um, and so the job that was listed was actually a kid's pastor job. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. I don't want to do a kid's pastor job again. Hmm. But I was like, I'll call and be faithful. And then all of a sudden she, you know, the lady on the, on the other line of the phone says, there's this other job that's just been listed. That I think you'd be perfect for just listening to you. And it's for a campus pastor position. Um, they're going to open a South Bay campus, and they're looking for a campus pastor to help launch it. In South Bay? In South Bay. Oh, okay. And so, yeah, maybe as part of my story you don't know. Yeah. So so the cool thing is is that so I, I go through, and, I, and I'm like, all right. And so I apply. It's actually through Slingshot. <laughs> get that? Okay. And so um, is where you have to apply through. I didn't, I didn't get connected through Slingshot, but um, the application process had to go through Slingshot. And if you're a stranger to all this, Slingshot is the process that – Rice that he used. Is yes, it's a it's kind of like a hiring agency. Hiring agency. churches. Yeah. Yes. And so so you know, I, I you know, I I put in all my information on Slingshot and kind of go through the process, don't hear anything back for a long time. Eventually I call back um this guy named Chris Lagerloff, who's awesome. I really like him. If you have never met him, you should. Um, but uh I don't know how you would. I don't know why I threw that out there, but he's great. I just really liked him. Um Shut up. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But you know, so I call him and say, Hey, I haven't heard anything. He goes, Oh yeah. He's like, they let me know that they're probably going in different directions. He's like, but he's like, I I've been talking with you and he's like, You're my recommendation. I know I'm gonna I'm gonna reach back out again. And I'm like, Okay, you know, whatever. And I, at this point, I'm kind of like, open hands, whatever you want, God. And so uh, so he reaches back out and then he reaches back out to me. And then I get a call from, um, another guy that is just taking a job at Shadow Mountain. His name's Andrew Stadsny. Um, fantastic guy as well. You yeah, know him well. We all know Andrew. Yeah. And, uh, and Andrew's like, can you get breakfast like tomorrow? And I'm like, absolutely. And so we go and get breakfast. And then from there, he invites me to come and be part of this interview process. Um, long story short, I get hired to be um, a assistant campus pastor to help launch the South Bay campus. Um, assistant campus pastor. Okay. Yes. So they only wanted to hire one campus pastor, um, but out of that interview process, which was crazy and and awesome, um, there's like s six of us all interviewing at the same time over an entire weekend. It was like a game show. It was, <laughs> it was crazy, and uh, um, they they en ended up deciding and saying, okay, we want to hire one guy who is awesome. His name's Dan Hauk, who you've also met met before. Love mm -hmm. him. Um, but they decided we also want to hire you. And so um, so they hired me and they said, we also want to open more campuses. We want you to be a campus pastor. And so, but can you help open this campus? So I actually ended up getting to help launch South Bay's campus, build um, the kids ministry, build Awana, build youth ministries, lead a whole bunch of um, volunteer staff as well as some paid staff um, and was just kind of helping lead this campus. And so, and getting it started from the ground up. And so that was pretty incredible. Mm. And then from there at the same time, um, we decided that Shadow Mountain has a international presence. If you don't know, that is David Jeremiah's uh, yeah. church. And so, but they don't really have a online campus at this point. There's no way to have engagement as you're watching their service online. And so we decided that we're going to build this campus. And so Andrew and I, we start to build this online campus completely. And um, we learned all about it. We met with different people all over um, Southern California that have done it before. And then we built it. And it was incredible. Um, I got to raise up um, some other staff to take over as campus pastors for that campus. Um, and then from that point, I ended up going and becoming the campus pastor for the Encinitas campus in Shadow Mountain. So, and I was there for about five years at the same time, also running the online campus. 
hmm. first season and then was able to empower some people to go and take over that as well. And so I know that's a long story, but that's the whole story. So you're at Encinitas for five years uh-huh. and then probably, I guess, year four, somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. If I remember right, it's not that you were like actively job hunting were you i think it was like i think andrew who you had worked with at shadow knew brandon and we were you know trying to figure out our next steps with with um kind of a a hole in our team that had happened with um losing the previous guy that we loved matt um and so i remember there was a, a kind of a few different interviews and it was kind of a long process we were coming out of covid all that nonsense um but when rise up so rise approached you right yeah yeah brandon approached you and um you guys decided to make the move eventually and, and join our team that was probably so that was 2001 right 2000, it was 2002 2001. Um, 2021 21 yeah yes what did I say? right after 2001 oh, so. <laughs> i was like i was like wow day it is so yeah that was summer of 21 so three years ago mm-hmm. four three years ago so somewhere going back from Three years here, and campus passion sonatas. You know, working with uh, the South Bay, doing kids ministry before that. Somewhere in that season, you started to get sort of this secondary idea about the future of like what would it look like for you to do your own church. Yeah. Like when did that? When did that sort of like mental germ sort of start to set in a little bit, and you start to think about it? Um, it started when I was still at Horizon. Oh, and so, way back then. Okay. yeah. So I was dreaming with um, a guy named Nick Pernicano, who was who ended up becoming the. This podcast is just like tons of name dropping. <laughs> well, and, and no one knows these people, <laughs> it's fine. but these yeah, people are important to me. Yeah, yeah, and so was, they, they are. Yeah, so totally, th- they're part of the story. And so, yeah. so I'm sorry. I know that these are names um, that no, no one's. No, everyone's like, I don't fine. know who these people no, are. That's good. Um, but I'm just kind of recounting the whole story. Even in my, I'm kind of going sentimental yeah, myself. That's great. Keep going. So, so I was talking with with Nick, and he was the junior high pastor that I wanted to really mentor. He came on staff, and and so I actually told him, I said, "Why don't you share my office?" And so he actually shared an office with me, um, and everything, just because I really wanted him nearby, so I could, you know, I saw a lot in him, and I still do, mm-hmm. and. Uh, and so I started dreaming about it then, right? And started dreaming with some different people at Horizon and, and there was thoughts and prayers and I just started dreaming about it, right? Um, started to realize more and more that it could be something. Um, even when I went to Shadow Mountain, it was still kind of in the back of my head. And at that time, I didn't think it was going to be a church plan. I just knew that I was passionate about empowering Christians because everywhere I went, I met amazing people who followed Jesus that I watched and I could see gifts and callings, passions, connections, resources in that I saw that were kind of sidelined a lot of times. And a lot of them would almost make the entirety of their spiritual journey almost living vicariously through the charismatic guy on stage or the charismatic small group of people on stage. And, and I and I started to kind of get a burden and a brokenness for it. And you've seen this in me. And, and, and I just got passionate about trying everything that I could and praying on my knees. God, would you help me to equip and empower the saints for the work of the ministry and really get them platformed to be the light of the world in a powerful way. And so it started a birth there. When I was at Shadow Mountain, um, I actually started to develop that more my heart and it actually turned into a name called Platform. Um, and again, I thought it was going to be something I haven't worked at. I, I built an app at one point and started building an app, um, like an application for your phone. Yeah. Um, and it was all about helping people find unity over um, common interests and passions. So it was kind of like this idea of you can cast your own vision on this app. It was like a social media app. And then people can unite together for for like causes that would build the kingdom together. And so I was trying any, anything and everything I could as I was dreaming together uh, with other people that I'd started to bring into this. About six years ago, um, I actually even built a website and started to build all these different things, started to put together a board. I remember there was a a pizza place in Logan Heights. And we even got some people together. There's people from Sacramento. And we actually got together for kind of a informal board meeting. But the idea was this could be the board. And at that time, I just sensed from the Lord, God said, wait. Hmm. And, and I was a little bit frustrated because like, God, I, I don't want to wait, you know? And I was like, I want to go right now. And at this, this point, I started to realize it would probably launch as a church. Um, and, you know, I started to think more and more. And, and over these next 
a few years after that, I would start to fall in love with the church um, and, and realize more and more, you know what, I want to plant a church. Um, mm-hmm. I love being a pastor. Um, I want to be with the people of God. And I also want to equip and empower them and platform them to be the light of the world. And so it, it started to, to gain steam more and more. And then even two years ago, a year and a half, Brandon and I started um, yeah. having conversations. Yeah, I remember when our first, when you first started sharing it with me, I remember um, I'm not the visionary that you are. I'm the, what about this, 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 and this, you know, guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do remember like you had like this, like you would talk about platform, you'd talk about like the empowering nature. And I remember, and some of this is a little vague, but I do remember like some of our conversations of, of me being like, it feels like part of what you're describing is almost what we, what we in this business might call parachurch. But like, it feels like for you to really do that, it needs to be a church. Mm-hmm. Um, like, I think you're going to struggle if it's like outside of churches trying to, and, and I know that was big. You know, we, we used to kind of talk through that a lot. And yeah. uh, and I, I think what I shared, and you, you started it and I kind of added in yesterday when we gave the update. Um, I think there were two reasons that it was important that we talked the way that we did. One of them was, um, you know, just as a, as a community of people, like <coughs> I have been on both sides of the the curtain as you might call it of of church world yeah i've i've been the person sitting in the chair hearing the leaders of the church say what they want to say and mm-hmm. then i've been the person behind the scenes working through things and what i've found is and i think you're with me and this is something that brandon was always with us like we shared this mentality of like when we were growing up in church and i don't mean necessarily like as kids but maybe like our formative years like the 20s 30s kind of thing um sometimes there's this this tendency for churches to want so badly to be run like businesses because there's some parts of businesses that are good and healthy Mm -hmm. and you want success that you forget that well you have business principles but ultimately you're something different yeah and the ability to be honest and to just say truth and just talk as human beings sometimes gets gets drowned out by the like you know this well this is how you know Google would do things so that and it's like that we're not that we're not Google yeah and I think what's hard is if you're not honest and you're not upfront and this is just human nature people will create their own narrative narrative like, mm-hmm. like in my head i will just create a story of well if you're not going to tell me what really happened i'm going to assume this really happened yeah i'll get a little bit of detail and that little bit of detail will then create something and so i think what we re- what the truth of our situation is if you knew nothing else and I, and i think that's the important disclaimer if you knew nothing else someone could look at this and be like oh robert wanted the job he didn't get it so now he's quitting hmm. And I think what was important for me both yesterday and then even sitting here now is it's not that we're denying that there isn't some truth to the timing, right? But there's so much more to the story and I want people to know it because if they don't know it, then it's just like, oh, okay, he didn't get a job, so now he's quitting. No, there's there's, (laughs) there's a 10, 20 year history that probably was always heading here and the events of the last six months just created a timetable that you didn't see coming, right? Um, and I think that's important because um, I think when we think about God moving or wanting to do something in our lives, if it feels like we're just knee-jerk reaction to things, yeah. like, well, this didn't work out, so I'm going to go to this thing, it's harder for us to accept believe trust that oh well, this is god this is god's moving as opposed to like i i what, what's what is this you know and so it was really important to me that as you stepped out into this that like people were able to know like hey before you craft a narrative in your mind here's the truth and the truth is this was always kind of coming um i think what's what's real and i i'm not i don't want to speak for you but I've, I've been on the journey with you is um, 
I don't, I don't want to share too much. We had multiple candidates for this job, right? Hmm. Three of them. We had five finalists, basically five people that we like. We're like, okay, these are great. Five great yeah. candidates. Three of those five people paused things that they were looking at doing to explore this job. Yep. Um, three of them. Only two of them were like currently doing something and like, no, we want to, this is like, we're on sort of a, dare I say, like a, 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 a career trajectory. Three of the five candidates were like, actually I was doing this thing. And then I saw this and it really captivated me and I'm interested. And I think the reason why that's important is because you're the only one that did it publicly <laughs> right yeah nobody else knows about the other two guys actually one of those guys was specifically in the process of planting a church and found out about rice city he's like he paused the whole process yeah because he's like hey this church is amazing and i want to see if maybe this is before i do that i want to see if maybe this is a thing and nobody's at least on our end because they don't know that person nobody's like well wait what do you do you know it's like and you were in a very similar position in the sense of yeah. what feels on the outside to other people like, oh, he didn't get the job, so he's quitting. You can create that narrative in your head. The truth is you paused a dream when Rye City opened uh, in the sense of like Brandon stepping down. You went after that because you said, hey, maybe it's this thing. Um, and you wanted that thing and, and I, there's nothing wrong. I mean, I don't ever want to gloss that over, but when it, when that door closed, maybe the timing was faster or whatever, but this was like in some ways for you in walking this with you, the whole Rise City job was kind of a, almost like not a, I don't want to say a blip. That's the wrong way of saying it, but like you were headed somewhere, the Rise City thing opened, then it closed and then you're just, you're back heading where you were heading. And I think people need to know that to understand yeah. your story and your journey because um, yeah, it's not, it's not just like, Oh, well, what do I do now? Kind of thing. Well, and to be vulnerable, you know, I mean, I would say even before, you know, even before the whole Brandon started leaving and things like that too. Um, I mean, about a year and a half ago when Brandon wasn't, didn't have actually clarity about that. Um, honestly, it's my love for the people that kind of caused me to pause too. I right. fell in love with the people here at Rice City and, and I love the people of Rice City. Yeah. Um, I really do. Um, and, and from there, and then I and then I started to dream and actually, um, you know, what would it look like and things like that. And I started to have these wellings up in my heart and some thoughts about it. And and then Brandon's thing started to accelerate more and more and more. And um and I and my heart really kind of was burdened and broken. And I was like, I I, I really want to pastor, pastor Rice City Church. Yeah. Um and and Rice City, Rice City was my first choice. Mm. And I I think that's important for me to, to say in a vulnerable way, the right to do is my first choice. Sure. Um, because I think that the Bible says that we can make our plans, but the Lord directs our steps. And, and oftentimes we do have our first choice and, um, there is something special about rice city. And I don't want to understate that. Mm -hmm. Um, it is painful to decide to make the decision to, um, to, to remove myself from staff and, and that kind of influence level. Um, with Rice City because I love Rice City Church. It is such a special church, a special people. It is. Um, but but Rice City, we decided to go in a different direction than making me the lead pastor. And and the truth is is that I I didn't quit right away. <laughs> um, no, you know, no. in fact, there was some so there was some external pressure to say say let's go plant a church. Like you know, I know that you know you're called to be a leader, and I'm like I am called to be a leader, and I know that I don't want to dismiss that, and I don't want to be disobedient by just letting what God has placed in me die or not be maximized for his kingdom. I refuse to let that happen, no matter what my emotions want, to, want me to do. Mm -hmm. And so, so I knew that, but I was so overcome with emotion that I was really careful. I did not want to even begin the process of launching or, or making that decision that I was going to start pushing towards that direction again out of an emotional response or even a reactionary thing to the occurrences that happened. And yeah. so I actually spent a lot of time um, making sure that n there was no sense of, man, I I'm reacting and emotional to this. And as a matter of fact, what I had told Brandon, and I told you as well, 
as I as I committed at the beginning of all this, actually year or, or like long before, not years, long before um, we actually opened the the position and everything like that. I said, "Don't worry, I will stay, at least until there's a new person hired." Yeah. And um and I knew that commitment that I made, and and my integrity demanded that I kept to it. And Which I, I would just say this: <laughs> that's that's where this story is kind of a little bit difficult and weird, because for me in this whole process, like you committed that to me and I appreciated it as mm -hmm. the interim leader who's like, please don't leave me. Yeah. Um, I think what's wild is you verbalized that and we were all like, okay, cool, great, thank you. Um, but the process happened so much faster than I think any of us expected. Yeah. Like for, if I'm being honest, if you had asked me in February, do you think you'll be able to hire someone by August? I was like, yeah, that's no pushing way. it. The fact that they would start August first, not yeah. a chance. Yeah. Like even like everyone that we worked with was like this, you know, best case scenario would probably be you identify someone in six months. Nine, twelve months is the average process. So when you said I'll stay, I was like, Oh, so you know, we're probably talking to at least Christmas or so. Yeah. And so, you know, then I come in your office like <laughs> what a month ago and I'm like, um, we hired someone <laughs> and they're starting in a month. <laughs> and it's like, wow. Oh. Um, so Again, narratives, external perspectives, for a lot of people who don't know all this, and why would they? It's like, well, this is happening so fast. It's like, well, yeah, it is happening fast because things happen fast on our end, right? Yeah. Like we we are way faster than we expected to be. Yeah. So for you to commit and say, hey, I'm going to stay here until you find somebody. I'm not. I'm just going to. I'm just going to ditch you guys. But this is what's next for me. So when yeah. you hire someone, I'm going to be ready to go. We're the ones that. <laughs> just flew through the process yeah and that in some ways that was even you know maybe if we could look back in time i would say like we can own and expect that we might have not not in the decision but in the process we we skipped some steps and went a little faster than we were even planning on going mm -hmm. so the fact that you're making a quick decision is hard relationally it's hard because uh, love to have it kept you around longer I know. but when you step back and look at everything that we had said and we had agreed to, it was a pre decision. Yeah, it, it was a pre decision. It was made before any of this happened. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I wanted to hold to that. You know, that was important for me to hold to. I knew what I was going to be called to do. Um, and, and my hope, my really big hope was, was to, was to get the chance to lead Rice City Church. Sure. Um, but I knew in my heart of hearts that God was calling me to lead. And for so much of my life, God had said, wait and prepare, wait and prepare. And, and now at this time in my life, God is saying go. And, um, and I think it's so important to be obedient, um, to whatever God calls you to. And I mean, it's digging deeper. So I'm, I'll be even vulnerable on other levels. I also have to protect my own heart. The Bible sure. says above all things, guard your heart because out of it stems the issues of life. Mm -hmm. And, um, man, I, this process has been really difficult and brutal, man. It's been emotional and hard and it's hurt on a lot yeah. of levels. And so, um, I've experienced and am experiencing heart hurt and heartbreak. Right. Yeah. Um, it, trust me, it, it's taken a lot of counsel, a lot of prayer, a lot of time to make sure that as I step into this next season, that I am, I'm, I can embrace a broken heart because I think that actually that's a really good thing to start something new for the for the Lord out of. And as a matter of fact, I don't know too many stories in the Bible where people did amazing things that, for the Lord that didn't start with a broken heart, right? And so, I mean, I'm okay with that. But I know that hurt can turn into bitterness. Yeah. And heartbreak can turn into envy. And so part of, part of it is also I, I'm guarding my own heart too. And I know that is really vulnerable. Um but it's true. It's true. Why it's, not true. Yeah. it's true. I I I I want to I want my relationship with Jesus. I mean, I have been through it before, like I shared, where my relationship with Jesus was compromised because of something that was happening in my heart in, mm -hmm. in, in hidden places. And so um I, I I can say I don't think that I ever got to bitterness or envy. But I, I also am at the place where I'm like, man, I'm gonna root for Rice City for the rest of my life. I'm gonna root and cheer for it. I really will. Re really will <laughs> speech impediments but um, but at the same time i'm also i'm going to move forward in what god's called me to do and be obedient to him with a whole heart that's committed to him and 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 without 
any type of seeds of bitterness or envy growing. And so there's a little bit of that as well, yeah. of, of wanting to hold to my integrity at a heart level. Because um, those are the important things that I think make you and I and, and whoever's listening, the leader, the man, woman that God can use is when you have a heart that is like the heart of David, like you spoke about yesterday, that says there's this one thing that I seek, this one thing that I desire is to dwell in the courts, in the house of the Lord for the rest of my life, right? For all the days of my life. And so, I mean, the way that you do that is you continually bear your heart before God. You protect it against any type of temptation that might come from other things. Mm -hmm. And you say, no matter what, I am going to reserve my heart for Jesus Christ. And so I think there's, this is a bigger issue, but it's, it's authenticity and transparency are such weird things because we get in these situations where, and I don't know if it's just the way I'm wired, if I'm wired differently, I don't know what it is, but I look at situations and it's like everybody, everybody's human. <laughs> everybody knows. Yeah. And yet, I find that people have to like talk as if they're politicians and be like, Oh, oh actually hey, it's this and that. And it's like, why don't we no. just, why don't we just tell, so we like have weaknesses. Yes. When somebody says like, well, you know, we got to make it look a certain way or, or, or brush it up and make it everyone. Let's all smile here and pretend it's like, it's okay to acknowledge that like coming into the office every day, in with a in a role that you wanted and now someone else is getting and if there's these other people it's like it's like to say like well you know just just pretend everything's fine and easy and simple it's like actually sometimes the wise thing to do is acknowledge that probably not healthy yeah. to keep this going because you see where it's going it leads to bitterness and envy and i don't want to go there absolutely so and there's a calling that, issue as well there is yeah i'm i'm, yeah. I'm separating the two yeah. they're, they're both in there I'm looking at the other side of it, but like, and almost like, but you, it's like, you can't say that out loud. You can't acknowledge that. I know. You that's why I said, brush that that's up why I said and, this is very vulnerable. Yeah. Yes. You, you, you throw that in the closet and all you talk about is, and I'm not saying you, I'm saying hypothetical. Yeah. Throw, throw that, throw that stuff in the closet, lock the door. Don't let anyone see it. Let's just smile and talk about, you know, God's calling me somewhere else. It's like both things can be true. It is. And you can acknowledge both things yeah. and you can be human and say, look, I absolutely 100% believe God is calling me to this. Yeah. I also am acknowledging that part of the reason I think he's calling me to this, part of it is it's a good time and a good season to go now because it, it'll keep me from maybe falling into some weirdness in my heart and that might be coming. Like to acknowledge both things is okay and it's wisdom. And I, I've respected you for that. Um, and I, it was important to me even now to like, I don't know, just make sure that people can hear that and know yeah. that. And the I, truth is, is I could have worked through that. If, if, if I felt like, if I felt like God was saying, stay and serve in this role in this capacity, um, I don't need to be the lead pastor or anything like that, mm -hmm. um, at a positional level. Um, but I know what God is calling me to. And so yeah. if God was calling me to stay, I know that I could have worked through that. Mm. That is something that I've had to... That's an important distinction. Yeah, I've had to actually persevere and grow through certain circumstances and 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 constant humility over and over again in circumstances before. Um, but at this point in my life, I, I knew from the get-go, from before I started mm. applying, before any of this, I knew that my next step, and I, could, I knew that the Holy Spirit was calling me and saying, now is the time. Mm -hmm. And so anything less than that would be disobedience, and I had to make a decision and say, and trust me, there, man, it's kind of like Brandon. Brandon would say a few times before he left, he said, I don't really want to leave, but I know I'm being called to this. I don't want to leave, but I'm, I know I'm called to this. Yeah. And I'm experiencing that. Mm. I don't want to. I don't want to, you know? It's it's, it's not fun. Like, I, I, I love Rice City Church. I love... I love all of you and I love you. And, and I'm like, man, I want to be with you and I want to serve and be part. And, mm -hmm. and yet I know that I would have to choose and say, okay, I'm going to let this continue to live. Um, but then all of these other things that God has called me to will just die. Yeah. Or am I going to be obedient to what God has called me to do? And it does mean that some of these things start to become a little different. I don't think die, but can we become a little different? But so that so that my obedience and the call of God on my life 
can actually be realized. Um, I don't know what it looks like. And I don't care if it's big, if it's small, if it's a failure. I don't care. I just want to be obedient to Jesus. I just want to actually live like a living sacrifice to him. And if that means laying down my desires, I'm going to get emotional. The things that I love, the people I love, um, the relationships I'm around all the time, I want to live as a living sacrifice. Hmm. And that means living by faith and taking crazy steps of faith, even leaving things that are comfortable, leaving things that are desirable in a lot of ways so that you can chase after things that God has ordained and called you to. Um, and I want to live by faith and not by sight. I want to live as a living sacrifice. I want my kids to learn how to live like living sacrifices for Jesus, where they would let go of their own desires. And it's not even about your own dreams. It's about God's call on your life and be obedient to it no matter what, come what may, whether it's sink or swim, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to give it to him. And I hope that he uses it and he brings people into his kingdom and he makes disciples. I hope all that happens, but Jesus builds the church. I don't want to manufacture a business. Um, I want to see God move. Hmm. And so the only way I know how to do that is to put my faith, trust, fidelity all in him and live that way. And so I, I am, and it's terrifying <laughs> um, and exciting <laughs> all at hmm. once and fulfilling and peace-filled. It's all those things. Yeah. Um, but it's hard. <sighs> hmm. It's an adventure. <laughs> it is an adventure. So, yeah. Well, for you, man. Um, yeah, I know in some ways too. Even yesterday, like first service, especially, it was like, is somebody dying? <laughs> it's like he's <laughs> still around or still friends. I just think it's that. Like I said, I I will definitely say like the even this like the Monday morning kind of thing is like yeah. Um, it's different between saying like oh somebody's still in town you can get lunch occasionally and working with someone every day is just such a yeah it's a it's a real it's a real loss for me personally and um uh but i i'm for you man i really am and uh yeah yeah i i do believe in a few years but look back and just see like look what god did yeah um, it's not goodbye it's let's yeah. introduce san diego to jesus together you yeah. know I said that in first service and i just i clung to that you know mm -hmm. um clinging to that if somebody wants to touch base with you, yeah. talk to you about the church plant, the ideas, I mean, like, is it, uh, we're not shutting off your email. Okay. <laughs> You're still Robert at Rice City Church as long yeah. as you need to. Um, so there's that way. Is the, is the website like live? Or? Yeah. You can go to platform SD as in San Diego.org. So platform SD.org. Couldn't get the dot com, huh? Um, no, else had it? someone else had it. Someone so, else has platform SD. Um, I, I don't know. I think I can probably get platformsd.com. Oh. But at the time, it was again. I got this website like six years ago, yeah. and the domain like six years ago. I have a bunch of other domains too, so I could change it up. Okay. But dot org was actually kind of the thing. Part of it was also I was at Shadow Mountain, which is their website is shadowmountain.org. Um, oh, okay. I'm pretty right. sure. Um, I don't know. Don't quote me on that. But uh, but I believe it's a dot org as well. So. Okay. So ORG was to me was like that's what churches do, gotcha. and so I, I don't know I whatever the time frame is, but you can go to platformsd.org and on the homepage you can actually um, there's actually a button that you can click to sign up for an email list, and I'm going to be sending out updates and then really more than anything just ways that you can pray with us. Um, man, that is the biggest thing I think right now. Yeah. I know that that's what Christians and pastors say all the time. I am realizing that it's actually not just a statement; <laughs> it's actually real because when you are leaping out in faith like this more than anything, you're like, I, I really need people to be in my corner praying with me. Mm -hmm. Um, but not just in my corner, but in the corner of what God's going to do. Like I want to see God move yeah. desperately. And so, um, you can find out how to be praying along with us on that. Um, and then you can learn more about what the church is going to look like and mission, vision, yeah. values, pillars of platform is what we call them. Um, all, all on the website and things like that too. And so, cool. yeah. All right. Exciting, man. Exciting. Uh, you know, maybe, Maybe when we'll have a digging deeper with platform church. So that'd be cool. That'd be cool. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it'd be good. All right, man. Well, love you. Love you too. Love you. Grateful for all of this and grateful for what's been, what's going to be. And, um, and I guess that's a wrap on this one. All right. All right, guys, we will 
We will see. I will see. <laughs> How do I end this? Oh, too real. Too real. <laughs> Someone will see you on the next episode. I'm digging deeper. I'm digging deeper. Thanks, everybody. All right.